It's really nice to be back in Harrisburg. Last time I was here, I spoke at the Simon Cameron House, which I had never seen until that day. And Tours made in Pennsylvania and only on PCM. It's really nice to be back in Harrisburg. Last time I was here, I spoke at the Simon Cameron House, which I had never seen until that day, and it was wonderful. And um, I have a lot of friends here, and I'm happy to see some of them here. Um, nice to see Mickey Rowley again, um, and I thank you all for the great work that you do. Um, Larry Keener Farley, who, and his lovely wife, who have led me in dancing exhibitions that are really scary in Washington. Um, I know you've seen them here as well. I saw them here. The great Lenwood Sloan, who keeps um, African American history, particularly USCT history, alive in Pennsylvania, who I'm always glad to see. And I know Matt Pinsker was acknowledged before. Where are you, Matt? Did you manage to come in at all, Matt? Well, then I don't have to acknowledge him. Well, he's here somewhere. He's being shy. Matt Pinsker is a fabulous historian and um, um, someone who is capable of telling readers that Lincoln in his sanctuary in the soldier's home in Washington not only rested but was endlessly creative and was a leader even at rest. And most of all, I thank uh, Rick Beard, my old friend Rick, for, for asking me to come down here for this evening. Um, anyway, what a perfect moment to mark the 150th anniversary plus 10 days of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, the seismic event of the Civil War, whatever Mr. Spielberg wants us to believe, and we can certainly talk about that in the question and answer period. Um, however decisive and final the um, 13th Amendment and its passage was, as you've all seen, I hope dramatized in the film, the Emancipation Proclamation was unquestionably the great historic moment of the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln, thought so. Uh, most Americans thought so. And you can get a glimpse of its huge importance in the extraordinary little exhibition upstairs here, which I was privileged to see before I came down here. And I urge you all to see it and come again and again while you have the opportunity to see one of 48 printed copies of the Emancipation Proclamation that were the brain, that all of which were the brainchild of Pennsylvanians. In this case, we have to admit they were from Philadelphia. But they decided to make souvenir editions of the Emancipation Proclamation and sell them at the 1864 Sanitary Fair in Philadelphia. And sort of attesting to the fact that Lincoln understood from the beginning the importance of this document to history, to the American people, and to his own reputation. He sat and painstakingly signed 48 copies of the document in a beautiful, firm hand, as you will see upstairs. Take a look at Lincoln's signature as opposed to the signatures of Secretary of State William Seward and his private secretary, John Nicolay. Theirs are a little more faded for good reason. They weren't using different ink. I just think Lincoln is pressing his hand on that paper. He wants that signature to last, and I have some evidence of that desire in his mind, um, which I'll talk to you about a little later. Anyway, the great irony of, these, of this special edition is that they were placed on sale at the Sanitary Commission in 1864, and they didn't sell out. Um, we don't know how many they sold and how many didn't sell, but we do know that Leland and, and Volcker, the, the two Union League founders who conceived of the idea of, the, of creating this edition, decided they should send some of them to a Boston charity fair trying to raise more money for wounded soldiers. That was the object of the enterprise in the first place. So some of them didn't sell. Now maybe it's because of the price, $10. Now people were paying a lot of money to get into the fair, so I don't quite get it, and I speculated about it in, in the book that I recently did, Emancipating Lincoln. Why did people not understand immediately how, what a bargain this was 
If you go upstairs and look at the wonderful engraving uh, that's sitting alongside the proclamation copy, the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, proof copies of those sold for $20. And they were enormous successes. The only explanation I can think of is that when they debuted in Philadelphia, Lincoln had just been nominated for a second term as president. And rather than create more interest, it sort of put him back in the realm of a partisan figure as opposed to a coalescing leader for freedom and liberty. Otherwise, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. The last copy that we had up for auction here uh, a, few, a few months ago sold for something like $3.5 million. So those $10 investments would have been very, very, very smart. I saw in one of your um, newspapers, $10, the equivalent of $250 today. It's really more than $250. $10 is a little more. Inflation Watch is not a perfect science. It's a, it's a website. But anyway, I'm, I'm dwelling on it because you've got this great exhibition. I'll tell you one other connection that you should know about in the show. How many of you got to see the proclamation already? Only a few. Oh, well, good. A good number of you. I don't know if you all saw the small etching behind the door, uh, which is a different view of Lincoln writing the proclamation. You have a positive view near the document, which shows Lincoln writing away, looking very proud with the symbols of liberty in the background and a Bible on the table. But in this little etching, which was done by the pro-Confederate uh, artist Adelbert Volk in Baltimore, he was a dentist, and you know how painful they can be, when they, even, <laughs> even with etchings. Um, Lincoln has his foot on a Bible. He's drawing ink from an inkstand proffered by Satan. There are portraits of slave uprisings that are meant to be negative, not positive, in the background. John Brown is shown with a halo, and he's called St. Brown of Ottawatomie. There's a vulture holding back the curtain, a vulture tie back. And there's a decanter on the table which is supposed to suggest that only a guy who was under the influence could have ever dreamed of writing such a radical document. I, oh, the Harrisburg connection, very briefly, and then I'll say why, I talk about why I mentioned the document as a proof of, 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 of attitudes in the, at the period. There is a little statue in the corner of there. I invite you to look at it next time you see. And it looks like almost, like something's pulled over Lincoln's face, stretching. Over, I'm sorry, not over Lincoln's face, over the statue's face. And what it is, is the, Scot the Scottish tam that Lincoln allegedly wore to disguise himself as he went through Baltimore. And where did he leave from to go to Baltimore? Harrisburg, a reception with Governor Curtin. I sort of snuck out at 6 o'clock and was off in a carriage before any of the generals who were guarding him knew what was happening. But that's another great story. Anyway. What the Volk etching shows, as strongly as Francis Carpenter's engraving of the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, is that opinion was divided. Most historians, most observers talk today about how reluctant they were to, um, how Lincoln was reluctant to issue the proclamation, how delayed it was, how half-hearted it was. Seeing this art, this negative art, is an indication to me, and a very strong one, that it was a very, very controversial document. And if I stopped short, it's because I turned to the left and I was talking about art and I didn't see the, the, the best Lincoln artist of our century sitting here, Wendy Allen of Gettysburg. So I wanted to acknowledge her as well. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> no more surprises because all of you are throwing me off stride here. So, it's also a perfect moment to explore the proclamation, as I say, because of the anniversary, because of the Spielberg film. I never thought, never thought I would make a Lincoln talk and in the first five minutes say, Lincoln has been nominated for 12 Academy Awards. <laughs> It'll never happen again. It's never happened before. But what a moment, Lincoln going Hollywood. Sadly, I am not going Hollywood, but I'm happy to be here. All, my, all the gang from the movie is in Hollywood now because um, the Golden Globes 
awards are Sunday. So that's like the first step on this long Oscar highway, there are these awards highways that they go, they go to every award, they campaign for it. Well, Lincoln himself said when he signed the document, not the ones upstairs, but the actual document, if my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act. He knew that. And yet, I think its reputation is very complicated. And it is a testimony to the fact that it was so controversial at the time. And how do we explain that? Well, one explanation is if you can get close enough to read the text and have the time to do so, is the listless legalese with which it was written. Um, the historian Richard Hofstadter famously said it was written with all the moral grandeur of a bill of lading. <laughs> and we all know what kind of prose Abraham Lincoln was capable of if motivated, and if he thought it was, as he said at Gettysburg, altogether fitting and proper. He didn't think it was altogether fitting and proper to write soaring prose. This was a legal document. This was a document that had to survive court challenges, that had to have every T cross and every I dotted. As a result of what he intuited was the right thing to do at the time, its reputation is not soaring because he expressed his ideas about freedom and liberty much more eloquently at Gettysburg and at, and at other venues. But I think the thing that really has made the reputation of the proclamation complicated is the um, frankly misleading, occasionally clumsy, which is unusual for Lincoln when it comes to political um, activities, and, and sometimes out and out hurtful activities that he undertook between July when he first broached the idea of a proclamation to his cabinet and September when he announced his decision publicly, all in 1862. A terrible year for Union and for the North and for the armies. And you see the, um, the, the, the carpenter image upstairs of Lincoln sitting with his cabinet and reading the document for the first time. Well, what happened at that cabinet meeting is that every single one of them, you know, it's true enough, as the label says, that they approved of it in descending order, beginning appropriately enough on the left. But no one in his cabinet encouraged Lincoln to issue the proclamation that day. In fact, they all found reasons to say, you can't do that. Um, the, Lincoln listened very pained at this response. And finally, William Seward, the Secretary of State, said, well, worst of all, I mean, people, what do they warn him? You have no power. Um, you're at a low point. Uh, Montgomery Blair, his postmaster general, said the, the presidential, uh, the, the off-year elections are coming up. The party is going to be devastated in the off-year elections if you do this now. And then Seward said, you can't issue it because we keep losing battles. The Union had just lost on the Virginia Peninsula. General McClellan had spent months and countless, sacrificed countless casualties in a totally hopeless, well, it wasn't hopeless. He made it hopeless by inertia and overestimating enemy forces. Seward said, if you issue this now, it'll seem like an act of desperation, a last shriek on the retreat. And Lincoln later said that, that really got to him. That made sense to him. So he folded it up, he tabled it, and waited for a Union victory, and waited, and waited. And taking his cabinet's negative advice to heart, he thought that his biggest responsibility between July and whenever that victory was going to be, if ever, was to prepare the American people for what was coming. And by American people, Lincoln had a very simple and distinct and isolated category in mind. White American men. Why? They voted. So what he did in the next three months is issue statements that were somewhat disingenuous and as I say, it can be somewhat hurtful if read today. Um, he had signed DC emancipation, unleashing great celebrations, even though that was compensated emancipation. He was, he signed a 
a law banning slavery in all the Western territories, which was always his first priority and his dream ever since running for president, ever since the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But now he hesitated. And the first thing he did was welcome a delegation of free African-American leaders to the White House. This was a the classic good news, bad news event. The good news was it was the first time a delegation of people of color had ever gone to the White House for any reason. And here they were coming face to face with the President of the United States. The bad news is the way he treated them. I mean, perfectly politely. But he said to them, and he had an Associated Press reporter standing next to him to take the notes. This was not an accident. He said, basically, and I paraphrase, well, he did say, your race are suffering the worst prejudice of any people in the history of the world. And then he said, you're the reason we're having a war. You're the reason white men are killing each other. If you weren't here, this could never have happened. So maybe you should go where the ban is not upon you. It is better for us both to be separated. Now, while those words were still stinging in the ears of these free people, some of whom had been in the United States as long as the Lincoln family, which came in the 17th century, Lincoln then laid out a plan for emigration, voluntary, but emigration to Haiti or other areas, Liberia, mostly a Haitian plan that he was, he was conjuring up. And he said, would you please let me know what you think. Please take it seriously. And they very politely said they would. And they went back and they had a conference and they wrote a very nice letter saying, we've thought about it, but you know, we, we actually live in Washington. You know, we've been here for a long time. And that's where we're staying. We're staying in Washington. But thank you. Frederick Douglass was not so polite. He said that Lincoln was using the language of the slave catcher, not the anti-slavery man. And that he's blaming the slave when he should have been blaming slavery for the Civil War. Well, Lincoln knew what had caused the Civil War. So then why did he have this conference? Well, the reason is, I think, very simple. First of all, I will concede, and I think we all should concede, that Lincoln did think, believe in colonization. It's something that he believed in from his earliest days in politics of admiring Henry Clay, who was the founder of the Colonization Society, and thought that it was a philanthropic thing to do. It was never forced emigration, but it was, it was a sense that African Americans could never live in the South, particularly on equal standing with, with white people, that white people would never allow slavery to disband as long as they thought free blacks would live in their midst. So this was a good thing for everybody. Anyway, this was pretty late in the game of that theory. What Lincoln was doing, why that AP reporter was there, is Lincoln was speaking to white people, to white voters in Philadelphia, in New York, which was about the most racist city in the United States, I will concede as a proud New Yorker, but we're about to get to the anniversary, 150th of the draft riots in New York, which where I'm working really hard to get recognized as a tectonic event in New York that is often ignored. You know, we have no historical markers in New York City about where those riots took place. We have no marker about where the Colored Orphans Asylum was burned down on 43rd Street and Fifth Avenue. People just stroll by, you know, walk into the library. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna stop that, but we'll change that, but that's, a, that's another story. Lenwood Sloan has been after me for years to do something about that. Um, Lincoln is speaking to people who don't support him. Lincoln has won only 39% of the popular vote just two years before, and only 54% of the popular vote in the North. 46% are against him. The Union Army is filled with Democratic generals, whom he inserted there because he wanted the war not to just be a Republican war. General McClellan, who is his commanding general, as much as he's messing up, <laughs> has already warned him that he's not going to fight a war that w is not intended to restore the Union as it was. He's not going to include slavery, uh, ending slavery, as one of his missions. He's hinted at a revolt of his officer's corps. This is what Lincoln is contending with. And that's why I think he is sending out the message to white people. Whatever I may do, I am 
harboring this secondary plan of inviting African Americans to relocate. He got a big congressional appropriation to pursue a plan, and he never spent it. He did authorize payment of a ship, volunteers, African Americans went to this new colony in Haiti. They stayed a few months. There was an epidemic of some sort of horrible disease. They wrote a letter to Lincoln and said, send the ship back. Lincoln sent the ship back, and they came back to the United States. So I think it was all a public facade. But as I say, it's injured the emancipation in history and memory and reputation. And then Horace Greeley, the powerful editor of the New York Tribune, <coughs> writes a letter um, to Lincoln called, uh, sorry, writes an editorial called The Prayer of Twenty Millions. Um, and the New York Tribune is the national anti-slavery paper at that point, at that time saying that the Lincoln administration had been strangely and disastrously remiss in not issuing an emancipation policy. Now I think, and I argue in my book, although this is a complicated story, I think Greeley had gotten wind of the fact that Lincoln had told his cabinet in July, this is now August, that he, was he wanted to do it and would wait for victory. Word is leaking out. I mean, this is Washington after all. You can see it in <clears throat> in some diaries. People know about it. So I think Greeley wrote the editorial not just to influence policy, but to take credit for what was imminent, what was already in the bag. Anyway, Lincoln writes a letter to Greeley. It's probably the most famous letter to the editor in American history, maybe second only to Mark Twain's letter saying the reports of my death have been exaggerated. That's the, probably the most famous. But this was pretty famous. And Lincoln wrote back um, and said, uh, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing some of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing none of the slaves, I would do it. What I do about slavery, I do to save the Union. Again. Lincoln had the proclamation now fully rewritten in his drawer. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to free some and leave others alone, just as he said in the letter. But he's setting the stage for white America. If he does anything, and of course Lincoln knows he's going to, it's going to be to save the Union. And then he begins to leak stories that none of his intentions are philanthropic. Nothing he will do is really it designed as a gesture to help people of color. It sounds craven, it sounds harsh, but it's real politics. And we saw the way real politics worked in the Lincoln movie, bribery for votes for the 13th Amendment, which is all true. It was tough out there. And Lincoln thought that if he issued a proclamation that people thought was purely philanthropic, then he would lose the country. McClellan could, I mean, there were people who thought McClellan would take his army and invade Washington. I mean, he had been totally unable to invade Richmond, so I don't see why anybody would have worried <laughs> that he could have invaded Washington, but um, it was a fear. And I think we have to look at these, these PR gestures in context. Lincoln had a an acutely brilliant public relations mind. I wish I was as good as he, because that's what I had been doing for a living for 40 years, but he was a master. He just twisted the press um, into believing everything he said. He planted stories. He sent out public letters. He invited reporters to hear official words. And this was all part of the prep and the run-up. Meanwhile, word is out, as I say, Lincoln told the vice president not to vacation because it was possible that he'd be needed for the actual emancipation. This is why I think word is leaking out, in fact. And that meeting took place at the soldier's home that Matt Pinsker has written about. On August 13th, a delegation of Chicago ministers comes to the White House and says, you know, God's will is that you free 
the slave, then this drives Lincoln completely up the wall. And he does another one of these statements. He says, if I knew what God's will was, I would do it, but what good would a proclamation from me do? It would have no effect. It would be like the Pope's bull against the comet. I don't know if you've heard that expression before from the Lincoln canon. Uh, there was a Pope, a Pope named Calixtus, who had issued a papal bull saying that Halley's Comet shall not appear in the sky. I ordain it. And of course, the next day, the comet went across <laughs> the sky. Well, that was what Lincoln had in mind. Now, some historians argue that um, that when Lincoln said that, he had lost his bearing politically. Why else would he say such a thing when he was going to issue the proclamation in a matter of days? And my answer to that is, you're looking at this from September 22nd backwards. He had no idea he was going to issue the proclamation in a matter of days because the Union lost again at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Not exactly the result that Lincoln was waiting for in order to justify the issuing of a proclamation. So I don't think Lincoln ever lost his political skills or bearing. He may be doing things that seem calculating, but he knows what the, what the goal is. He knows what the end game is, as we call it today. And then finally on September 17th, who should finally provide the victory that that Lincoln had been waiting for, but General McClellan, the biggest thorn in his side, the reason why he was delaying, the reason why he was issuing statements to placate not only the northern public and press, but also the military. And of course, the event September 17th was the Battle of Antietam. Four days, five days later, Lincoln calls his cabinet back into session and sits them down in a different room, interestingly enough, than the painting portrays in the library. It was very interesting. You know, in those days, cabinets really voted on issues. Lincoln had been criticized for not taking votes often enough, but it was more, you, more like the Israeli cabinet. You know, something you read that the Israeli cabinet voted five to three for settlements. They take those votes very seriously, and Lincoln did too. It was American tradition in the cabinet then. Lincoln took, brought the cabinet together and he said something very interesting. You'll recall that during July I brought you together and I read you my proclamation and you advised me to delay. Well, when Lee invaded Maryland, I made a pact with God that if we should drive him out, I would issue the proclamation freeing the slaves. That promise must now be kept. In other words, no vote. It was now between Lincoln and God. Maybe those ministers had had an impact after all, but this had taken on a new meaning. That day, the preliminary proclamation is issued. Lincoln says that slaves will be then, thenceforward, and forever free as of January 1st, 100 days later. I think he knew that because he could have issued the proclamation any time between the 17th and the 22nd of September. But he waited for that nice round warning number, 100 days. Why did he give warning? Why didn't he just do it? Well, because again, his, he's very systematic about covering all of the legal steps that are necessary. Between September and January, 100 days probably pass very, very slowly. For one thing, the Union loses another horrific battle at Fredericksburg. There are lots of people in the country, if you read the editorials, as I'm doing now for a new book, who think that Lincoln will never go through with it. The attacks on the preliminary proclamation have been so vicious. Lincoln has been excoriated in New York, in Chicago, overseas, as someone who's fomenting race war, as a desperate tyrant, doing things that no, the Constitution would never allow. And there was some sense that, in fact, he would let the clock run out and then Try a different strategy. So New Year's Day comes, January 1st. Lincoln goes to his office, and the official proclamation is, as they say, unrolled. So you can imagine it was on a vellum scroll, unrolled. It had the great seal of the United States on it and a ribbon. And Lincoln said, I'm going to read it. I'm, I'm making that up. But he read it, so he must have said, I'm going to read it first. 
And he read it from beginning to end, all those whereases and hereunto's and all of that. And the revolutionary stuff, which was, I invite African Americans to join. I mean, it has one of the great conundrums in the history of presidential declarations. I enjoin liberated slaves not to rise up in violence against their masters. And then the next sentence, I encourage liberated slaves to join the army of the United States. What were they supposed to do? You know, the, it's sort of a reversal of that first recommendation. But that was a pretty revolutionary act. Anyway, Lincoln looks at it and gets to the last paragraph, which is a template, which says, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my name and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Two words were transposed. No big deal. But Lincoln said, I can't do it this way. It has to be absolutely perfect, letter for letter. I know it's New Year's Day. Now I'm making this up again. Wake up the scribe. He may have been out on New Year's Eve. He may have been watching Guy Lombardo or Dick Clark. But get him, get him up. And um, I don't even know who the new guy is who took Dick Clark's place. That shows you what I'm locked in a culture of warp, too. But uh, Ryan Seacrest, is that who it is? Okay. So he go back and redo the proclamation. Meanwhile, Lincoln had an obligation to go to his own New Year's reception in the White House, an annual event. Now, people have been gathering in black churches and in northern white churches with freedmen since midnight, waiting for the word, singing hymns, reading prayers, waiting. You know, it's called the midnight hour, but we're now up to 10 AM, so it's 10 hours later, and there's no word. Unbeknownst to the people waiting in church, Lincoln goes down to the New Year's reception, and he greets diplomats and generals and ambassadors and consuls for hours. They're still waiting in the churches. No word. I imagine that many sent riders to the telegraph office. What's the word on the wires? Are the wires working? What's going on? No word. And then the public is allowed in after the diplomats leave. Two more hours of greeting people. So we don't know exactly when Lincoln got back to his office, but I would calculate it's got to be about two or three in the afternoon. People are still waiting in the churches and there's no word. What must they have thought with all of the editorials in the newspapers suggesting he's gonna, he's gonna sort of wink out and not do this? Well, he gets to the office and he opens up the scroll again, written by the scribe. It's still fresh, you probably can still smell the ink, and he reads it again and everybody's holding their breath in the room. There are only three people in the room. Secretary of State Seward, Seward's son Frederick, who is his personal secretary, and Lincoln's personal secretary, John Nicolay. Two of those three signed the document upstairs. Frederick Seward did not, but Nicolay and Seward did. And he reads it, and an exhalation of air, he says it's perfect. And he picks up a pen, and he holds it up, and then he puts it down. And then he picks up the pen again, dips it in ink, and then he puts it down again. And how could the three witnesses in the room not have wondered, is he not going to do it after all? Finally, he looked up and he said, I have been shaking hands for hours, and my hand is, so, is paralyzed. If I sign the document now, my signature will appear tremulous. And people will look at it in a hundred years and think he hesitated. But my whole heart is in it. And he sat there and massaged one of those gigantic hands with the other hand until he was good and ready. And he had the feeling back and then he picked up the pen and he signed out a very bold Abraham Lincoln and looked up and said, there, that will do. Because by that point, his whole heart was in it. It was an unbelievable moment. Now the irony of all of this is in terms of creating a canonical piece that we can keep and cherish. Where are these emancipation proclamations or emancipations proclamation or whatever we, however we pluralize them? Well, the one that Lincoln wrote in, on December 31st to be copied by the scribe 
and the one he wrote on September 22nd to be printed in advance. Where are they? Well, another charity fair in Chicago asked Lincoln for the proclamation, the final proclamation, to sell for charity. And he really didn't want to part with it. He really wanted to keep it. But all the congressmen from Illinois wrote him and lobbied him, and he finally, finally sent it. Sent it through the mail. Can you imagine? Just put it in an envelope. <laughs> sent it. And they sold it at the Great Northwestern Sanitary Fair. And of course, it raised the most money of any item donated to the fair. So Lincoln gets a package by Adams Express. That was the FedEx of its day. Adams Express box. And it says, Dear Mr. President, the, the, the document raised $3,000, the most valuable item donated to the fair. So you have won a gold watch donated to the Chicago Sanitary Fair to go to the highest donor. Now today, a president would probably not keep that kind of thing, would put it in the library or something. Anyway, I keep imagining that in that scene this, in the Spielberg movie where Daniel Day-Lewis is playing with the ticking watch, you know, waiting for the vote. By the way, they recorded the ticking from a period watch in the Lincoln Presidential Library. They wanted the ticking to be just right. Um, my suggestions they didn't take, but the ticking they got perfectly well. Um, he took the watch and he kept it. The final proclamation he signed that day that he said, I want, you know, I want my signature to be bold. It's shown at the National Archives every few years, and guess what? His signature has almost vanished. And that's because the vellum paper they used, that parchment-like paper, didn't really hold ink that well. Look at the Declaration. Look at the Constitution. You can barely see our founding documents or the emancipation. But these things he wrote on rag paper, like the copy upstairs, are perfectly fine. He then was asked to donate the preliminary proclamation to a fair in Albany, New York, my state capital, my Harrisburg. Um, and he did. And it was, it was raffled off for a, a 25 cents a chance. Garrett Smith, the abolitionist who had helped fund John Brown, bought 1,000 chances and won it. You know, actuarial statistics and odds sometimes work. And he held it and was going to donate it to another fair also. When Lincoln was, the war ended, Lincoln was assassinated, and Garrett Smith sold it to the New York State Legislature in one of the last, actually, laws that they passed was to buy the proclamation in 1865. Um, that's supposed to be a joke about how inept our legislature is. You live in a state capital, you get that kind of thing. Actually, they're doing much, ours is doing much better now. Um, and the one that was donated to Chicago, the final proclamation in Lincoln's hand, perished in the Chicago fire. The one in New York, in Albany, was in a fire. It was in the 1911 New York State Capitol fire and was rescued by a state trooper. <coughs> along with the Flushing Remonstrance and these other incredible documents that were on view in the Capitol. And um, it's a fire that nobody knew about because it was only a few weeks after the famous Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. So nobody really heard about the threat to the proclamation. And it still exists. We just sent it around New York State for the 150th anniversary of the preliminary proclamation. And we found something extraordinary with it that um, that I that we didn't I think New York State didn't even know it owned, but I want to just tell you about it. Apparently, in September of 1962, a hundred years after that preliminary proclamation, Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York held an event about the proclamation in New York, and invited as the keynote speaker the young minister Martin Luther King Jr. This is September 62. It's a few months before Dr. King becomes the most famous voice in the country. Certainly the most famous voice for freedom. And Dr. King gave a speech about the Emancipation Proclamation that I don't think anybody knows about because it was not published. He left his manuscript on the podium and it was put in the New York State Civil War Centennial Archive and it lives in the New York State Archives. Now, that's not to say that the King family doesn't have a claim to it, and they may claim it, but right now it's, anyway, it's an extraordinary speech. And as we wonder about 
whether the Emancipation Proclamation does or does not deserve a positive reputation. Sure, it didn't free slaves in areas where Lincoln had no control, at least not immediately. But every Union soldier who fought in the South from January 1st forward freed people as they fought. African Americans liberated themselves as Union armies neared. <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people got freedom just under the proclamation. And it created the atmosphere for the, for the 13th Amendment that ended slavery everywhere. Yes, slavery didn't end on January 1st, 1863, but neither did the Declaration of Independence create an independent United States on July 4th, 1776. These declarations have to be fought for, not just enacted and obeyed immediately. But Dr. King said this 50 years ago and 100 years after the preliminary proclamation. If our nation had done nothing more in its whole history than to create just two documents, its contribution to civilization would be imperishable. The first is the Declaration, and the other is that which we are here to honor tonight as are we, the Emancipation Proclamation. All tyrants, past, present, and future, are powerless to bury the truths in these declarations, no matter how extensive their legions, how vast their power, and how malignant their evil. When Abraham Lincoln signed the proclamation, it was not the act of an opportunistic politician issuing a hollow pronouncement to placate a pressure group. The proclamation shattered in one blow the slave system, undermining the foundations of the economy of the rebellious South and guaranteed that no slaveholding class, if permitted to exist in defeat, could prepare a new and deadlier war after its resuscitation. Fifty years have passed. The reputation of the proclamation has had its ebbs and flows, but it still brings people out to mark these extraordinary events. And as you look at the document upstairs tonight or in future days here in Harrisburg, I just invite you to remember that it was not an easy thing for Lincoln to do in the political reality in which he operated. It was the right thing to do, but it was still a brave thing to do, and I think he deserves enormous credit for it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes, according to the schedule, for questions. I'd be glad to answer anything about Lincoln, the proclamation, the movie. Somebody surely wants to ask about the movie. So that's fine. That's allowed, too. Somebody always has to be the first, then it's easy. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. Did you all, should I repeat the question? What happened in the South? Uh, what did, how did enslaved people react? Did, were they immediately, did they immediately feel themselves liberated and did they so act? It's an excellent question. You know, no one has ever really come to any final way of, of dealing with it. There are, there, I know many African American historians like Edna Green Medford of Howard University who believes that slaves knew. How did they know? They said because people who worked in houses and plantations were barely visible, like not even recognized by their white owners. The white owners would sit there reading newspapers and saying, this damnable proclamation, Lincoln thinks he can do what he wants, and they would act as if the, the, their servants didn't even know what was going on. Um, some knew how to read, even though they weren't allowed to by law, and some heard and spread the word. But it's, a, it's an impossible thing to rise up on the day anointed by you know, an unknown person in Washington and end your own enslavement. What happened is, though, when Union troops were, continued their activities in the South, they were armed not only with guns and rifles, but with tiny versions of the proclamation. They were printed by the tens of thousands and given to the troops. And the officers were instructed, when they got to a house, when they got to a plantation or a farm, 
give it to the person who answers the front door while you're stealing their pigs for supper <laughs> and say, guess what? Your people are not slaves anymore because we're here and they should come with us. And they did. And as 1863 goes on, enslaved people know what awaits them if the Union Army gets near. And they act accordingly on their own. And it's incredibly brave because a, an enslaved person who walks off a plantation, even if it's just guarded by young people and women, the women are armed. They take their life in their hands when they make that move. You know, they can hold up the Emancipation Proclamation all they want, but the Southern owners are not recognizing its validity. I just found a terrific example of one of the things that happened that I didn't know about before, but it's, you know, it exists in newspapers. In July 1863, I mean, what do we know about July 1863? The most famous events are the capture of Vicksburg and the, the victory at Gettysburg. But outside of Vicksburg, Jefferson Davis had a still functioning plantation with about 115 slaves who never left. They had an overseer, a male overseer. And when they heard that Grant's army was engaged in the, the end of a siege, they just left and walked to the army. And there were reports in the papers about the poetic justice of Jefferson Davis's slaves freeing themselves under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a very little known story, but I'm gonna try to get it out there soon. Yes, sir. Who originated the 13th Amendment? Who originated the 13th Amendment? That's a great question. The, the, the credit probably goes to some, a women's group, a women's philanthropic, progressive, equal rights group who f wrote the first known petitions to Congress suggesting it as early as not long after the Vicksburg event. Again, the proclamation did not cover the slaveholding states still in the Union, like Missouri, the, uh, Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, slavery still legal and not banned there under the terms of the proclamation because the governments were in place, however fragile. So that's the first response and some members of Congress talk about it and some don't talk about it. And then the next year, the Senate passes a resolution, but the House defeats it. It needs to be passed by two thirds of both houses before it goes to the states for three quarters approval. What Lincoln does, it's not in the movie, but what Lincoln does that should be recognized is he insists that the 1864 platform of his party that renominates him in June of 64, same time as he signed those things upstairs, had a plank saying we have to have a constitutional amendment ending slavery everywhere. So that's when he takes a leadership role. And these were in the days when, when convention platforms were serious, serious business. Um, and um, um, people read them. Who's read the platform? Anybody read a platform since 1972 when we had our last platform debate? Anyway, that was, that was the inception. But it belongs to, I wish I remembered the name of the group of women who wrote those first petitions. Yes? What, if anything, about the movie disappointed you? That I didn't get to go to the set, as promised. <laughs> that was my deal if I worked as a script consultant. And then the union said I couldn't even be called a script consultant in the credits. That's my second disappointment, because I'm not a member of the um, Screenwriters Guild. So, and I'm not gonna join the Screenwriters Guild because I didn't get paid to be a script writing consultant. So, so they listed me as a content consultant. And someone who knows me very well said, I can't believe that you were content. And I said, no, no, no. It's not content, it's content. Anyway. Um, Mr. Day-Lewis decided he wanted a closed set. He didn't want anyone around, so. Okay, but I have to answer your question seriously. Um, disappointed me. I mean, I guess I agree with the people who say that the characters of Elizabeth Keckley and even the president's body person were sort of under, under portrayed. They seemed sort of callow and not serious people. Elizabeth Keckley, particularly, that was a real opportunity. She was an interesting woman. She was not, she was a dressmaker and she was Mary Lincoln's intimate. They, first of all, they made her too young. She seemed like a young, you know, servant. She wasn't a servant. She was a hired dressmaker, a very good dressmaker. She made dresses for Jefferson Davis's wife, interestingly. She's a woman who bought her own freedom. 
bought her son's freedom. And she was a leader of the Contraband Society in Washington. She got Mary Lincoln to contribute money to buy blankets for the freedmen who had nowhere to go and no way to keep warm in the winter of 1862. A very interesting lady and not really given, I mean she has one speech on the porch where she, um, where she says, you know, talks to Lincoln about whether, what will happen to our people and Lincoln says, I don't know you, your people, which is a pretty frank moment. But I don't know, disappointments, the little factual errors that they didn't want to fix, I guess, little things. But I wasn't disappointed. I mean, I think it was, it was terrific. I don't know, how many people have seen it? Whoa. <laughs> That's why it's made $150 million. I mean. Did everybody like it? Yes. Thaddeus Stevens is, is, I mean, Tommy Lee Jones, he wasn't, you know, he was a pretty unpopular fellow and he was sort of repulsive in a way, you know, he was a, he was, and he was much older, you know, he was a 70 year old, which then was like an 85 or 90 year old and, you know, Tommy Lee Jones is what, 65 or so and he may be a weather beaten cowboy, but that wasn't Thaddeus Stevens. Um, but Stevens had, you know, been a, in the vanguard of radical change for 30 years. And he was on his best behavior during this debate. But he had every reason to, to believe himself vindicated as one of the pioneers of equality. And he, you know, he, he had lived with a woman of color for many years. He had adopted her children. It was an open secret in Washington. She wasn't a Patha Merkerson, but she was a well-known person in Washington. Not that anybody in Washington society ever acknowledged them or treated him as less than a pariah. I mean, this was a southern city. And um, so he was an extraordinarily brave fellow and so hated by the Confederacy that um, I, don't, I don't remember where in um, Gettysburg vicinity his... Um, his um, ironworks were Caledonia, is that it? But they made a they made a bee war a, a bee line to burn it down, just knowing that Stevens had quote incited uh, emancipation and abolition all these years. But it's great. I mean, he's never going to be thought of as a fringe character again, thanks to Spielberg, which is a nice shows you the power of the moving image. Woodrow Wilson said it was history written with lightning even though it was about birth of a nation that he said it. Yes, sir. Do you know what any reaction there was from the four remaining slave states of the state of the Union to the emancipation and especially the uh, Amendment? Reaction in the, in the Union slave states to emancipation. Well, in Baltimore, it was, the newspapers in Baltimore condemned Lincoln as a tyrant. In Delaware, slavery was dying out. But what Maryland did that's interesting is Maryland didn't wait for the 13th Amendment. Maryland passed its own state abolition of slavery in 64 during the election. There were big illuminations at night. I think between the proclamation and the resolution, the handwriting was on the wall. But after the proclamation, Lincoln archives are filled with letters from slave owners in Kentucky and Missouri who write saying, my people have totally misunderstood your document and they think they're free. I expect to be compensated. I expect them to be returned. I expect the army to drop whatever it's doing, like, you know, keeping the Confederates out and get my property back. So it was, it was dicey and generally unpopular. Maryland actually did an extraordinary thing in doing its own, um, its own emancipation order. And then you see Lincoln in the movie um, telling that, um, uh, Alexander Stevens uh, that he has no worry that even if the southern states come back, he can get three quarters of the states to endorse the proclamation because he knows that Louisiana has been reconstituted with a pro-union government, as has Arkansas. And those are his trump cards. But there's one state, I think it's Georgia, that didn't ratify the 13th Amendment until the 1980s. They just sort of did it as a, a courtesy in the 1980s. That was the last state to do it. Yes? 
Yeah, the, I, my own research with like the Hutchinson family, where they used to go and sing abolition songs at the camps. You had mentioned about the, the singers, singers you mean? Uh, yeah, the Hutchinson family. family. Uh, when they would sing songs about abolition, it would start near riots in the Union camps, which, uh, when you were speaking about the fact that Lincoln was worried about what the army would do, what did the army do? Lincoln is the best guide to that. He writes um, right after the preliminary proclamation to his vice president, you know, I've gotten some, I'm paraphrasing, I've gotten some good editorials, but the troops come forward more slowly than ever. The st uh, and this looked at in its face is not very good. Uh, praise is all that a vain man could wish, but breath alone kills no rebels. If you ever think, one think that Lincoln was a softy, a pardoner as commander in chief, look at that letter, breath alone kills no rebels. That was what his goal was, to kill, to kill rebels. And he was petrified that the Union Army would react badly to the preliminary proclamation, which it did, Illinois desertions, and particularly badly to enlistment. And that's one of the reasons why he, his next bad decision, I think, but who knows what pressures, I mean, who can imagine what pressures were on him, was to give African-American volunteers a lower pay than white, uh, white soldiers. And not only that, instead of giving them a bonus for their uniform, they charged them for their uniforms and no African-American officers. He's worried that the whole army would desert. Now, J Jim McPherson disagrees with me. He thinks that the army was re remarkably swift in coming around. And of course, if you look at soldier letters, as much as he has, and he's looked at many more than I, they, there, are, there are remarkable expressions of, of uh, a new sense that, that slavery needs to be eradicated because these northern boys have gone to the south and they've actually seen the institution that they've read about. They've only read about. They've seen people forced to work. They've seen the degradation. They've seen the squalor. And they, and they do get, some of them, many of them do get inspired to do more. And they do get to, to, uh, to the point where they want this to be a part of their struggle. But soldier letters are filled with attacks on Lincoln and use of the N-word. And, and so it's a mixed bag. And Lincoln has to balance it. It's one of the reasons he needed 180,000 African American soldiers to counterweight, to counterbalance the desertions and the lack of enlistments. Something in the back I saw? Yes? In a word, yes, it's a mask. Because what Lincoln's election does is spell the doom of the slave power. And the slave aristocracy knows that. Why do they secede? It's not just that Lincoln is disobliging. It's that he has pledged that there will be no more slave. Slavery will not ex be allowed in any Western territory. Western territories are going to be broken up into new states. New states are going to have two anti-slavery senators and House members. And eventually, the balance will tip so there can be an amendment to the Constitution ending slavery. They see that in 1860. And they don't want, it, it's interesting because according to the state rights theory of government, that would have been fine. They just didn't want to get to that point. So they said that this guy is abrogating states' rights, which he really wasn't doing. He was willing. He, you know, in Lincoln's own estimations, before emancipation, or even after preliminary, about when slavery would completely disappear from the United States. It was the one instance in his entire million words of writing when he used 1900 as a goal. He didn't think it was going to be easy or swift, but it was too swift, even at the end of the century, for the slaveholding South. But there is no question that Lincoln loosed himself from the moorings of the Constitution more than any president had before. I mean, John Adams had authorized the Alien and Sedition Act, 
but nothing like Lincoln, suppressing newspapers, suspending the writ of habeas corpus, military tribunals. And what does John Wilkes Booth commit to his diary? That this is a Caesar, and I'm the Brutus, and people will thank me because he has so much power. And that's not the way our government was created. But the power is being exercised in pursuit of freedom. So we tend to forgive it, although it's still worth talking about. How far do we let our executives go in pursuit of goals that they say are right? It's an age-old question. I missed somebody back here who still had a question. Oh, a few. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, one point and a question. There is a book coming out about Mrs. Lincoln's dressmaker next month. It's a novel. Yeah, it's a historical fiction, but it's still mm -hmm. And but there's, yes, there, it, but Jennifer Fleischner, who's a friend of mine, did a great book called Mrs. Keckley and Mrs. Lincoln a few, just a few years ago. She was quoted in the New York Times yesterday, I think, as well. See, my biggest question is, I read it, like, but every time I read it, I decided, and I read that Daniel Day Lewis was very careful how he portrayed Lincoln. What health-wise do you think was going on with him? He was almost like a giraffe where he wasn't really, yeah, like where he wasn't really graceful with his body and he yeah. kind of drugged himself. And I, I, that's very observant of you, I think. Um, well, there are lots of theories about what Lincoln's health was like in 1865. He had lost, clearly lost weight. His face had grown very haggard. And, you know, he's the classic case of the president who ages 20 years in, in, in four. But it happens to most presidents. If you look, look at what President Obama said at the National Press Club. You know, he showed this picture of himself. He did a PowerPoint show. Did anybody see, anybody see that? It was on C-SPAN. He shows a picture of himself. This is what I look like when I first ran for president, this wonderful, young, energetic, handsome guy. And this is what I look like now. And he showed all the gray hairs. He said, and of course, if you, would, if you will grace me with a second term, this is what I will look like in four years. <laughs> and he showed a picture of Morgan Freeman. It's very funny. <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis studied all of the accounts of Lincoln's physique, his movements, and people always said that Lincoln stood in a slouched way and that when he walked, he lifted up his entire foot and put it down, that he didn't walk heel to toe like most people did. And this is a size 16 shoe, so Think of it clopping along. That scene where he goes down the corridor of the White House and down the stairs, that's really as close as I've ever seen anybody try to approximate um, what Lincoln really must have looked like to people of his time. But you know, Day-Lewis Day studied the voice and the gestures and the way Lincoln held his hands in sculpture. He, look, his method acting is the stuff of legend in Hollywood. When he did the last of the Mohicans, he didn't bathe for like six months. And nobody wanted to be on the set with him because, you know, <laughs> his character wouldn't have bathed. And when he did, um, <coughs> I heard all these great Hollywood stories after I got to be part of a minor fringe part of this ensemble. <coughs> when he did My Left Foot, remember that movie? He won his first Oscar. So he was in a wheelchair playing a quadriplegic with a great brain who was, felt trapped in his own body. And Daniel, and he wouldn't eat at the lunch commissary with the other actors. You know, the movie, I don't know if you've ever been to a movie set, they, one thing they have is great food. The caterers, they bring in great food. So he wouldn't, he wouldn't eat with them. He insisted on being spoon-fed by an assistant because that's what Christy Brown, his character, would have done. So the crew got really angry at him. They couldn't stand it anymore. Who was this guy? He wasn't even famous. So they took his wheelchair. He was in the wheelchair the whole time, never left the wheelchair. So they took the wheelchair and pushed it down a slope, <laughs> thinking, well, this will show. He'll jump up and he'll yell at us. He never spoke. He rolled down in the wheelchair, and the wheelchair toppled over on him, and he lay there until they came and got him. So this is a man who is like the method to the nth degree. He gets into these characters. Do you think he had I don't think he had this uh, Marfan syndrome. That's the big complaint which is if you look at pictures of Marfan's patients, they have very spidery fingers and they're supposedly very weak. Lincoln was still able on his last trip on, the, on his uh, presidential steamboat coming back from the front to 
look at a big ax on the floor. Some of you may be old enough to remember when there were always axes in schools and wooden boats. In case of fire, break glass. No one knew what was behind the glass, but that was the admonition. So he would take the ax between his thumb and his forefinger and hold it out parallel to the ground. And then he would hold it out for a few seconds and let it slam to the deck of the ship and say, do any of the young men want to try that? And they all tried it and they couldn't do it. So that's not a Marfan. And when they took his clothes off after he was shot, in the movie he was wearing a lovely nightgown. But in, for, in Peterson House he wasn't wearing a nightgown, I assure you. They got rid of his clothes fast because there was so much blood they wanted to see if he had been stabbed. They, all the doctors sort of gasped. It was like seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger without a shirt. They all said, look at his arms, look at his shoulders. Who could have imagined that he really looked like this beneath the surface? Because he had an old face. But he was in terrific shape, so he couldn't have had Marfan's. Whether he had cardiovascular disease, I don't know. He, you know, he had great teeth, which is always a mark of good health. Beautiful white teeth, very rare for that time. Because he never used tobacco, never chewed, never smoked. He didn't drink whiskey. He didn't drink red wine, the bane of our existence, if you want dental health. He was in good shape. 56 years old. He may not have looked 56 in his face, but he was in good physical condition. It was really moving when they showed him so small, the end, the bed so small, and how he had to be. Yeah. They did it well. That was a big moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure. You. Yes. When making a movie, I mean, you try not to do it if you can avoid it, but occasionally you have to sacrifice historical accuracy for entertainment value. Um, were there any instances of this in uh, Lincoln that really stuck out in your mind? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I don't know if I accept the pre the, the, what your question is predicated on, because I'm not sure they have to. But, well, they, they, but they, they, that's what I was there for, and they did. I'll, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll let loose with a couple of, of problem areas. The drama in the House of Representatives. Well, this is the big one. The drama in the House of Representatives. What will Connecticut do? Um, New Jersey doesn't look very happy today. Um, look at the delegation from, from New Jersey. That's the pivotal one, in the movie and in history. They look sour, they look unpredictable. <clears throat> and then they call the role New Jersey, Connecticut. Well, the problem is that's not the way people sat in the House of Representatives and that's not the way people voted. They voted alphabetically. They sat by seniority, separated by the aisle. They don't call it both sides of the aisle for nothing. Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other side. They sat by party and they sat by by seniority. But they felt that they had to do it this way to keep the drama of the focus on the, on the um, lame duck congressmen, the lame duck Democrats from northern, generally Democratic states. That's the kind of answer I was looking for. All right, that's, that's very interesting. And there's more, but I don't want to, I'm, we're being photographed. I don't want to seem like an ingrate. Yeah. How influential do you think the Fugitive Slave Act was to the eventual making of the uh, Emancipation? I mean, the Fugitive Slave Act was obviously the most onerous of acts, except for the slave system itself, especially as it impacted on freedom-loving people in the North because of the requirements of returning enslaved people if they discover them, and the penalties against people who didn't do it when required. But Abraham Lincoln was willing, don't forget, in his 1861 inaugural address to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act if it meant that the seceding states would return to the Union and just forget about all the discord. He said it, it's in, it's in the inaugural. So unfortunately, the Fugitive Slave Act is one of those trade-offs that Lincoln was willing to make for peace um, and union. It may have been one of those trade-offs that he knew he didn't have to trade off, but he said it, it's in the record. It's the mixed bag with the Fugitive Slave Act. And remember, he, he was fine with the Compromise of 1850, which introduced it. It was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act where white settlers could vote to embrace slavery and bring it west. That's where he put his toe in the sand, not over fugitive slave. And that's one of the reasons why Frederick Douglass always called him a slave catcher, because he was angry at him for those 
was furious about the Fugitive Slave Act endorsement in the first inaugural, furious. It's always interesting to read Douglas and Lincoln together. Yes? I'm just going to suggest that we'll take one more question. Okay. In the back. Thank you. Um, to what extent um, is Lincoln's political theater uh, that he engaged in from uh, July of 1862 to September of 1862, to what extent is that responsible for um, the lost cause narrative of the Civil War orders or the dying school of, of the causes of the Civil War? And, did Lincoln ever express regret for inviting the African American delegation uh, into the White House and disrespectful of his intentions or writing a letter to the editor on uh, more serious First of all, I love your description of it all as political theater. I intend, if you see that in one of my future. I borrowed it from, <laughs> from you, though, Oh, really? Did I say it? <laughs> then I'm embarrassed that I like it so much. Um, <laughs> Is it in the book? Is it an emancipating Lincoln? Good. I must read that again. You call Lincoln's actions disingenuous, potentially. Okay. But political theater is good. Um, I think it's a, it, I've never heard anyone quite make the comparison that it's tit for tat, one, one disingenuous view of historical developments inspired another. I mean, I think that the lost cause myth was inspired by um, you know, this split in, in the historiography of the war, the Jubal Early version, the, the Confederate veterans version, especially after Lee dies, that sanctifies Lee, and it says that he never lost. He just gave up because to save people, he never, never really lost a battle with the South, was not really interested in slavery, it was only interested in states' rights. But I don't think it was in reaction to Lincoln's being disingenuous. It might have been a reaction to Reconstruction, which was the, it's a whole other story about how Lincoln would have managed that. But your other question is, um, um, is, is, in, is interesting, and it's um, I, one I hadn't really thought about much, but did he ever apologize to those freedmen? Absolutely not. Uh, you know what's true now of politics is true then, you don't apologize. Yeah. Remember when, Bill Clinton apologized for slavery. I mean, everybody went insane in this country, or m many people went, went crazy about it. And actually, he did it in Africa. He was apologizing for the uprooting of families. He was a, a, apologizing for the African slave trade. I, it's a, I remember the incident imperfectly, but I remember that it aroused great controversy. Presidents, by and large, never, Jimmy Carter apologized a lot, and you saw what happened to him. It doesn't, it doesn't really work politically. He never, look, he got back at Greeley in many, many ways. Not by saying, gotcha, on the letter, but here's what he did, and I didn't say this in the narrative, and I'll leave, I'll leave you with this because it's a great example of Lincoln's press skills, his public relations skills. He was really irritated that Greeley wrote that editorial, and must have been especially so if he thought that Greeley um, uh, knew that the proclamation was coming and was trying to position himself to be the hero because he had whispered about it to one of Greeley's correspondents, Sidney Howard Gay, who was in the White House. Lincoln talked to him. Gay went back to New York and maybe that's why Greeley did the editorial. So Lincoln did write the famous letter to the editor, to Greeley, but guess what? He gave it to another newspaper to publish first <laughs> and it was published in a Washington paper first and when Greeley saw that, that he had been scooped, and that he would have to publish it the next day as only a news report and not as a person letter. He said, I give up. He said, your old Abe is too smart for me. <laughs> Thank you.